and um, it's probably the mo one of my most used phrases this year, but is everybody able to see my screen? Thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody for um, attending the talk. I know this was a little bit delayed. We were going to do it in person, um, but as we all know, the pandemic hit and I'm very happy that we were able to accommodate and actually do this remotely because I do think this is some pretty exciting work that we've been up to um, both at Princeton and a little bit during my PhD and what I plan to continue as assistant professor at Santa Cruz. So um, yes, I'm gonna talk about accelerating graph applications on parallel heterogeneous architectures. Like Bob said previously, I was a postdoc at Princeton University. I was working with Margaret Martinosi, and it sounds like you guys will be hearing from her soon. She's a great speaker, and so you're really going to enjoy that. Um, and now I'm an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz. It said Santa Barbara in the email. They're not that far away, though, so that's a that's an okay mistake. Um, okay, let's see. First, I yeah, I'll just give a little bit of a bio. You know, normally when you give talks in person, you can walk around a little bit before and after and, and mingle a little bit, but in this format, you can't really. So um, just so you know who I am, that's a, a much better picture of me than I, than I look now with when I'd get haircuts. But um, you know, my background is in programming languages. And in particular, I did GPU programming models. I did my PhD at Imperial College London in the UK. Um, as I was doing GPU programming models, I got frustrated because GPUs are a pain to program and I was really wondering why all this painful components of the GPU bubbled up into the programming languages that I had to deal with then as a programmer. So for a postdoc, I really wanted to peek under the hood and you know, learn about how people are actually designing architectures and why this sort of stuff does bubble up. So um, I ended up getting a postdoc with Margaret Martinosi, who you, you guys all know, she works in computer architecture. And it was kind of the perfect spot for me to actually look at how new chips are designed. Um, so a quick overview of the talk. Um, what I want to talk about to begin with is that computations on dense data, this has improved steadily throughout the years, but it's actually starting to slow down and it really isn't all that efficient despite what you might hear. Now, important applications have sparse foundations. And you know, a lot of times this is exposed in, in terms of like a graph computation. But this sparse um, structure is not really exploited, and it's because we don't really know how to exploit it very well. So my contributions in this domain is I've looked at an optimizing graph application compiler for GPUs. If we want to be able to eventually exploit this sparse structure, we need to be able to compile it efficiently for architectures that are out there and available now, like GPUs. Um, and then I want to talk about a hardware software co-design that I worked on at Princeton where we worked on a new architecture that can accelerate graph analytic architectures. Um, I just wanna say, feel free to interrupt me at any time during the talk if you have questions. Um, I, might attend, uh, I might say a few things that are intentionally meant to stir up some discussion. So if you want to bite on any of those, I would be happy for that. Um, okay, great. Let's start out with some motivation. So, when I was a PhD student in London, I flew on a plane across the ocean and I landed and the first thing I needed was a cell phone. Um, I really embraced the poor graduate student lifestyle and I bought this phone for about eight pounds at the local Tesco. When I graduated with uh, my degree, I treated myself and I bought myself a new iPhone, which at this point I've since upgraded to the iPhone 12. And as you can imagine, going from a phone like this to the iPhone it is pretty startling and it's, it's actually a lot of fun. And I am still blown away by how cool my iPhone is. And you know, you can actually start to quantify kind of the improvements we've made in sm smartphone technology over the year. And you know, one thing I really like about my smartphone is how pretty the pictures look on it. You can measure this uh, with a metric called PPI. It's the pixel density of different iPhones. And you can see since 2007 to 2017, uh, this has increased about 3x over 10 years. And if you want to visually see what that increase looks like, you can have a picture over here. This is my, uh, the famous rivalry in Utah, which is BYU versus University of Utah. In 2007, a picture might've looked like that. In 2017, a picture would look like that. Pretty startling and pretty cool. Another thing that I've been really excited about watching computing trends over the years is artificial intelligence. And you know who isn't excited about this? 
And one of the funnest things I think is that uh, an AI developed by Google DeepMind was able to beat a human player playing this game called StarCraft. And if you've ever played this game, you know that it's a pretty fast paced game. There's a lot going on. And this is, you know, I think it's amazing that we were able to train an AI to do this. And again, we can start to measure why this happened. We, and we can do this by looking at how fast GPUs are because GPUs are what are used to train these AIs that do this sort of stuff. And if you look at the gigaflops or how many um, floating point operations per second these GPUs are able to do. And if you go from 2011 to 2017, you know, this is about a 3.6 X increase in six years. Pretty cool. Now, um, some of you might be sitting there saying, I don't know why you're so excited. Computing has always been, um, it's always been advancing and it's always been advancing pretty quickly. And you know, just even in my lifetime, I remember the first computer we bought growing up was in 2003. It was this nice uh, blue Apple computer and it ran at 700 megahertz. The next computer we got was in 2007 and it, run, it ran at 2.1 gigahertz. Now, that's pretty obvious where your computing increase is coming from. Your computer is just running faster, so it's able to do more computations faster. I think that's a little bit obvious. But if I was to go to the Apple store today in 2019, and if I was to expect the same 3x increase, I would ask for a computer that ran at 15.75 gigahertz. Um, the poor employee at the Apple store wouldn't know what to do with me. They would show me one of their top of the line models at 2.5 gigahertz and that's where I would be. This is only a 1.2 X increase in 12 years. So if the computer frequency is only increasing by 1.2 X, but yet we're getting these big advances in um, the pixel density and in AI, where is that coming from? And you know, before anybody uh, stops to, to stops me here, I know that Apple came out with their new M1 processor and I think that goes up to about 3.15. So that does change these numbers a little bit. But my point here remains that where you're not getting the increase in raw compute frequency that we have or that we were getting in the early 2000s and even before then. So where is all this advancing and computing happening? Well, heterogeneity and specialization is coming to the rescue. When previously we just operated or we just used kind of a monolithic CPU, we, most of our devices are now split into a CPU GPU system. Um, and for those of you who don't know, GPU stands for graphics processing unit. So it's pretty clear that a GPU is actually going to help with things like pixel density and allowing your phone to display um, prettier images faster. But GPUs are also kind of the foundation on what you use to train these deep neural networks on to get the AI um, that is able to eventually play video games and beat human players. And, you know, these days it's not even just the GPU. We now have really complicated heterogeneous systems. You have Google's TPU or tensor processing unit, um, FPGAs, Intel and Microsoft are hooking them up. Apple has a neural engine. So our devices are getting more and more heterogeneous and it's enabling all these cool advances that I was talking about. But I wanna take a slightly deeper dive now. I wanna look at computing advances for a bit longer of a trend and a little bit more scientific than just getting um, GPU clock speeds off of Wikipedia. If we take a step back and if we go and look at the top 500, this is a list of the fastest supercomputers in the world and it's updated twice a year. Um, this graph, let's see, hopefully you can see my mouse cursor. There's three different lines here. You have the top, the number one computer, and this is a performance on the y-axis and this is a year on the x-axis. Um, note that the performance is logarithmic. So this is exponential increase in computing power. Um, this is the number one computer. You can see some years it changes, some years it doesn't. This is the bottom computer. You can see that trails behind the top one, but it's still increasing. And then the green is the sum of all of them. This looks pretty good. It looks like we're still making exponential increases in computing, but how is this actually measured? So what is the actual benchmark here? So it's something called HP LINPACK. And what this does is it solves a system of dense linear equations. Now, I promise I won't put too many memes in this talk, but if you actually look at what solving dense linear equations means, it's actually mostly dense matrix multiplication. And the variant that this benchmark is, is parameterized by the matrix size. So when you evaluate your supercomputer, you can basically put in however big of a size of matrix as you want. And it means <clears throat> you can basically scale your system out to be as parallel as you can make it, and you will get a higher score on this benchmark. So, 
This matrix multiplication, as a lot of you might know, is, is probably one of the most important kernels in computer science right now. And in fact, if we think about other applications and especially other high impact applications, matrix multiplication is behind personalized advertising. So these recommendation systems, like when Facebook or Google recommends an ad to you, it selects its ad based on some machine learning using matrix multiplication. Now, we've always kind of conjectured this, but in 2020, uh, Facebook actually released a paper talking about um, how they do recommendations. And it turns out that they do use lots of matrix multiplication. Um, I'll, I'll get some numbers soon, but I just want to um, note that this paper that again came out in February of this year, uh, David Brooks was also one of Margaret Martinosi's students and Carol Jean Wu was also one of Margaret's students. So <laughs> it's kind of a small world. Um, you know, according to this paper, um, when you have MLPerf, which is kind of a, a nice standard baseline for doing for benchmarking machine learning, recommendation systems are about 90% matrix multiplication. And this paper talks about when Facebook actually deploys their recommendation systems, they're about 30 to 90% matrix multiplication. And the more serious recommendation um, recommendations, like when they choose which status, statuses to promote, that's where you get up into about the 90% matrix multiplication. And you know, so matrix multiplication is really underpinning a lot of the profits of these companies. You know, Google has about 85% of its revenue from ads. Facebook is about 985 Um I'm going to do one more meme here just to show that personalized advertising algorithms is really just dense matrix multiplication and DNNs underneath the hood. And you know, this, this might be a slightly tenuous connection here, but it seems like as DNN accuracy increases, these companies have been able to sell their ads as being more um, valuable. So this is a graph from 2012 to 2016. The blue line shows the error rate of DNN uh, models on ImageNet. So you can see that over the years, we were able to get more and more accurate DNNs. But these are the same sort of DNNs that these companies are using to train your personalized ads. And Facebook has been able to then take their ad revenue and go up and up and up. So what ends up happening is the ad profits increase by 5.2x over 16 years. Um, you know, the, own, the users of Facebook only increase by 2x between this amount so somehow between 2012 and 2016, Facebook was able to convince people that their ads were 2.7x more valuable. And this really corresponds to our ability to train DNNs more and more efficiently. So you can see um, this matrix multiplication, the ability to do it efficiently is basically underpinning the economic model of a lot of these big companies. So, I mean, so what's going on? We, we are really good at doing matrix multiplication. Those graphs from the top 500 show that um, and the story is likely similar at these big data centers for Facebook and Google. Um, you know, these companies make their money off of doing uh, matrix multiplication fast. But as a researcher, what I need to do is I need to look out for um, kind of where this is going in the future. And I should try to position my research to affect where this might go in the future. So what I want to do is ask, will matrix multiplication continue to scale like we've seen? Can't find what? And um, then I also want to ask if we are computing these applications as efficiently as possible. Well, actually, like some of you might have noticed is when you go back to this data from the top 500, if you, there's enough data here that we can actually do projections and we can do a linear line through these. At current, every single metric in 2020 is underperforming where it's projecting. That means that this looks like it's slowing down. I know it doesn't look like it's underperforming by much, but keep in mind that this is a logarithmic scale. So little gaps actually end up corresponding to big distances. And if we think about um, the current trends in architecture, we can kind of see, you know, pe people who work in architecture, you can see that the systems like NVIDIA GPUs already have fast paths for matrix multiplication at this point. Um, Moore's law is ending. We're not getting smaller transistors. So the writing's kind of on the wall that we're gonna stop scaling for these dense computations. Now, what I find is a little bit more depressing is we can look at how much faster we're doing these dense computations, but we need to ask ourselves if, if we're actually doing them efficiently. So for this, we can go look at the green 500. This is like the top 500, but it ranks systems based on how energy efficient they are. Um, 
So they don't give you a nice pretty graph for the green 500 because it's actually a little bit depressing. If we look uh, in 2017, uh, this is megaflops per watt and going up to um, November of this year, what we'd see is in 3.5 years, we've only been able to do this, these dense matrix multiplication about 1.8x more efficiently, whereas we're getting a 4.7x increase in speed. So we're able to do these things faster, but we're eating up more and more energy. And as somebody who's um, concerned about climate change, I mean, we were just barely evacuated from our apartments in Santa Cruz because of the wildfires. This can be a little bit depressing. Okay. May we ask questions online? Um, yes, please. I'm curious, uh, in your contacted professional circles, especially in a commercial context, it tends to be different at the big national labs, although I'm going to guess that at some point 10 years in the future, the refrigeration requirements are going to become an issue. But is it just a sort of a tangent, I suppose, in a commercial context, in the Facebooks and the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, are, to your experience or conversation, are there efforts to improve energy efficiency in these very large data centers? Uh, uh, let's look at it from the point of view of computation where heavy matrix ops essentially determine a very large part of their compute load. Yes, well, and I think that's, that's a valid assumption that, that I've been going at that, yes, matrix, dense matrix ops are a huge part of their workload. Um, I don't know that I've seen huge pushes for energy efficiency. Um, the TPU, if you, if you dive into their ISCA paper, and I think it was 2017, you will see that one of their big selling points for the TPU is energy efficiency rather than speed. The TPU is actually not that much faster than a high-end GPU. Energy efficiency wise, it's about five to six X better though. Um, another thing that I know Google's doing and I know it doesn't directly attack the, the issue though is they've committed to going green energy. And I think they have reached that goal. But in terms of concentrated efforts to actually have more energy efficient computations, I haven't seen a whole lot. I did, um, I don't have a source for this but I did see that um, Google and Facebook combined use about as much energy as Trenton does the city. So they are using a lot of electricity for their data centers. It seems like the nanometer and very small geometries today could be used to reduce power without increasing the speed as one advantage of them as they do shrink. Yes, the, the question is though is, how much more it's going to shrink. So Apple has five nanometer in the iPhone 12. And I think Samsung has three nanometer on their roadmap, but I don't think anybody has any less than that, that I have been, that I've heard about at least. So yes, you will get some efficiency there, but the roadmaps don't really go much past that. And that, I think that's what people sort of talk about when they talk about Moore's law ending, which arguably it's already ended or it's on its dying last steps. Okay, great question. Does anybody else have any comments? Okay, cool, let's move on. So this doesn't look so good. Um, and as a researcher, what I want to do though is, you know, this, this spells trouble in the near future, which is um, actually not a bad place to be for an academic because it's a lot of opportunities for research. So let's actually go and look at some of the algorithms that these companies are doing. And specifically, let's look at these advertising algorithms. And I'm gonna do the world's simplest explanation of recommendation algorithms. So here there's a picture of me and there's a picture of my collaborator, Anina Manocha. She's a PhD student at Princeton who I worked with. Now, what happens is her and I both have a smartphone and whatever platform we're using, Google or Facebook, they're gonna know that both of us go to Princeton University. So it's gonna connect us through this link. Now, what it might also know is that I like football and I'm a fan of the Philadelphia Eagles. So it's gonna connect me to the Philadelphia Eagles. What it might also know is that Aninda really likes restaurants and she likes eating at Mistral, which is a very nice restaurant in Princeton if you've ever been. So what's gonna happen is when Aninda needs an advertisement on her phone, the algorithm might look at this connection where I like the Eagles, but she, doesn't, um, she isn't instantly connected to them and it shows that it might be worthwhile to connect her to the Eagles. Conversely, it might advertise a nice restaurant that Aninda likes to me. And so this is 
a very simplified version of how these applications work for personalized advertising. Well, if you are like me, you'll notice that this doesn't look like a matrix multiplication problem. In fact, it looks like a graph problem. And there are several graph applications that do try to encode this um, bipartite network projection, collaborative filtering. But um, what happens is that this is a graph application and more so is it, it's also a sparse problem. So what do I mean by sparse? I mean that if you look at the NFL teams that I could potentially like, I probably only like a couple of them that are worthwhile for the advertising algorithm for me to know about. The rest you can basically zero out. So it creates a sparse data problem. But modern approaches, and they do talk about this in the Facebook paper that I reference, they take the sparse data and they embed it into a dense matrix multiplication problem. Now, what happens when you do that? Well, you lose structure and you lose some of the sparsity. So let's talk about why this happens. Well, if you encode your problem as a dense DNN computation, there's been huge improvements in DNN algorithms in the past decades. A lot of very smart people have made them very good. There's a lot of good programming language support like TensorFlow and PyTorch. And as we saw, the architectures are getting faster and faster at doing these sorts of computations. Now, so all this said, it seems like a good idea to phrase your problems in terms of matrix multiplication. But as we saw, some of the cons are that the hardware scaling is actually slowing and for those of you, I'm sure that you've seen the news, these have a black box approach. It's hard to actually demystify some of the answers that they give you. Now, if we go over to the sparse graph computations, what are the pros? So these days when people are looking at doing sparse computations, it actually ends up that there's a lot fewer computations required. This is still pretty new research, but um, it's looking like you can do much fewer computations, albeit they're sparse computations and they're hard to do efficiently but um, some estimates are about 1,000x fewer computations. You get to keep your structure, so it's easier to actually justify the results that you get. You can easily trace the path from um, the Mistral restaurant through Aninda through Princeton to me, you can justify it. Now, the cons of graph and sparse computations is that the algorithms, you need to specialize them to do what you want them to do, and today they're not quite up to being as accurate as the DNN computations. And also there's not a lot of programming language and architecture innovations that will help you out here. But as a researcher, what I see is that the cons of the dense DNN computations, they're actually kind of terminal, their prognosis. If the hardware isn't, isn't scaling as well and we've, we've trimmed it down a lot and this black box approach seems to be really hard, those are some pretty difficult problems that don't have, seem to have a good solution on the horizon. Whereas the sparse computation, basically we need to study algorithms a little bit better and we need programming, more programming language and architecture innovations. I see that as an opportunity, especially where people are estimating that you can do about a thousand X fewer computations if you stay in the sparse and graph computations. So that's what I wanna talk about. That's sort of the big high level motivation of my work. I'm gonna dive into some of the more technical nitty gritties now, but I just wanna talk about two of my um, research projects as I've tried to enable graph applications on big data um, so that it can hopefully eventually replace the dense DNN computations that we do. So the first thing I'm gonna talk a little bit about is doing graph applications on GPUs. And then I'm gonna talk about our, some new hardware software co-designs for fast graph processing. So does anybody have any questions or comments at this point? Really in the context, I suppose, of fusion of application, I know for example, in conversations with people from Applied Minds, I know they had developed a graph knowledge base product. I think it was called Firebase that was sold to Google. And the notion of graph oriented data representation goes all the way back to basically expert system, prolog, sort of deterministic and logic traversals across graph problems. What's interesting to me is it would, it would seem a natural extension that for low level sensory or associative processing, deep neural nets would be the way to go. But then in terms of, in a sense, persistence or some other storage that uh, knowledge storage would be graph oriented. Are there approaches that are sort of fusing these thinkings? Um, I am not actually sure if I have a good answer for that. Um, what I've been looking at is a lot of these recommendation systems um, and what I've seen is like that Facebook paper talks about is basically you embed the, the sparse structure into a dense structure and you basically lose a lot of information when you do that. And 
that actually seems to be the trend in a lot of um, AI type kind, kind of pattern recognition work. Like you can take classes on how to embed sparse structures as, des as dense structures um, these days. So I would think, I would, you know, graph, graph analytics is kind of a, a, a bad word these days because it's so hard to do efficiently. So I would think that anytime you have big data and graphs, people are probably trying to move those towards dense computations at this point. And a little bit of the um, carpenter hammer nail syndrome in a sense by pervasiveness of GPUs these days as the most prevalent specialized architecture that people are trying to squeeze cycles out of. They're going to say, well, you know, I'll tell you what, the right way to do this is to run this on a dense engine and, and GPUs are really good at dense problems. Yes, I agree completely. And, and in fact, my last slide has the sentence, if you build it, they will come, hopefully. <laughs> so my, what I'm kind of hoping here is I work on the PL and architecture design. And if we start making this more efficient, then we can attract some of the data scientists who really know these, how to design these sorts of algorithms. And maybe they will start becoming interest, interested in doing it like this if you can show that they can do their computations more efficient. Yes, absolutely. Okay, cool, let's move on. So I'm gonna do a brief presentation. This is our paper. Um, we published this in ISWIC, which is the International Symposium on work, uh, Workload Characterization, uh, 2019. We actually won a best paper award for this work. Um, let's see, I did this with a collaborator, Sripathi Pai at University of Rochester and my PhD advisor, um, Ali Donaldson, who is at Imperial. So, you know, there, there's a myth that GPUs are bad at graph problems. And typically when I, when I present this work, somebody will raise their hand at this point and, and say that. So I'm gonna preempt that and have this on a slide. So the truth is, is that GPUs are actually the most efficient devices for big data graph analytics. This is by a nearly a factor of two. And you can get on the, the graph 500, which is similarly like the world record for the most efficient graph computations. And you can see that the most energy efficient graph computations are on GPUs. But there is, there is some truth to this myth. And the truth is, is that graph analytics on GPUs is really hard. You know, GPUs have a highly parallel programming model. Um, they only expose low level programming languages like CUDA and OpenCL. And the parallel, parallelism in graph computations is irregular. So you do have to do tricks to load balance and make sure things are actually happening um, in a way that fits the GPU, the, the more stringent GPU programming model. So, in this project, what we worked on is an optimizing graph application domain specific language for GPUs. And what we did is we actually made an effort to do make this portable across many different GPUs. I know a lot of people just think GPU means NVIDIA, but actually there are more mobile GPUs out there than there are NVIDIA GPUs. We wanted to be able to target those. So we performed a massive empirical study. This is 240 hours across six different GPUs. And we took our DSL and our optimizing compiler and our big question is, is what optimizations should we apply? And what we found is that these optimizations can actually provide pretty impressive speed ups up to 16 X um, and a geo mean of about 1.5 X across our entire domain. But you know, the, the, the term optimization is a little bit misleading because you know, if you apply these optimizations in the wrong way, you can actually provide slowdowns in this domain up to 22 X. So you have to be very judicious on how you apply these optimizations. So we wanted to study performance portability in terms of these optimizations. Um, and what we found is, you know, kind of the, the previous definitions of performance portability really fall short in this domain. They produce trivial or biased results. This is because this is a really difficult domain. The, I mean, the GPUs are all very different architecturally. So different optimizations have different effects. And also graph applications are different depending on the input. Um, operating on a road ne network is very different than operating on a social uh, social media network. So um, what we did is we came up with this new rank-based statistical procedure. Uh, this offers a new way to think about performance portability, especially when your domain is sort of as chaotic as graph applications on GPUs. Um, so yeah, the headlines here that we produce non-trivial non performance portable optimizations, um, and we can kind of be as portable or as specialized as we want. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a background on GPUs. Um, the very first definition of a GPU I found was in 1999. This was coined by NVIDIA. NVIDIA says the technical definition of a GPU is a single chip processor with integrated transform lighting triangle rendering in images or rendering engines that are capable of processing 10 million polygons per second. So 
What I find interesting about this definition of a GPU is it's a lot about graphics. 20 years later, if you go on NVIDIA's website, their homepage is advertising a GPU that doesn't even have a video output, the, G, the DGX2. So the definition of a GPU has just sort of really been very fluid and it's evolved over the years. And if you try to define the modern GPU, you're gonna have a really hard time. You know, they're still used for high-end graphics, kind of like what they were originally defined for, but now they're in all the top supercomputers and they're going closer to the edge. In fact, everybody probably has a GPU in their pocket right now in their smartphone. So when you're writing a compiler though, what you need is you need a sort of mental performance model. And if you try to do this across the variety of different GPUs you have now, you're gonna get stuck really quick. You know, what, one architectural feature that GPUs have is um, SIMD vector lanes. Well, how wide are they? NVIDIA has 32, Intel has eight, old ARM GPUs have one, AMD has 64. That's a massive discrepancy in those. You know, some people say GPUs have high bandwidth. Well, that's true if you have NVIDIA and AMD that are connected to their special high bandwidth uh, DDR, but integrated GPUs like ARM and Qualcomm are just connected to the same main memory as your processor. So it's not really high bandwidth. I mean, even highly parallel, um, NVIDIA GPUs in the data center can execute 10,000 threads concurrently. An ARM GPU can execute 500 threads concurrently. So these have very different architectural um, architectural characteristics and that's going to affect how you optimize for them. So what is the role of the compiler here? So, you know, as these GPUs have diversified, we have to judiciously apply optimizations. We have to be careful so that we are actually providing speed ups and try not to provide slowdowns as much as possible. And we should be able to specialize when possible, but also generalize if we can't specialize. So a lot, uh, heavy, heavy weight on the role of a compiler right here. Um, we already gave an introduction to graphs, but you know, if you apply the same um, treatment to graphs, if you look at the original definition of graphs was Euler's Konensberg bridges, which if you look at Google Maps right here, you can see that there is um, four bridges. I think in the original problem, there were seven. I think a couple of them were demolished, some of them intentionally and some of them in war, but you can represent the bridges as a graph problem. Now, unlike GPUs, the definition of a graph has stayed pretty steady, but what has not stayed steady is the size of graphs. Euler had four edges and how many nodes? Let's see, four edges and uh, four nodes. But if you look at the size of modern graphs, for example, social networks, you can see st something like Instagram has about a billion nodes and on the order of uh, 16 billion edges. Netflix is another a network that you could think of as a graph and that has about 140 million nodes. So Euler had a pretty good idea, but I don't know that he would have imagined the scale of graphs today. And you know, like we talked about, there's applications here with recommendation systems and information spread. And now what we want to talk about is performance portability graphs on GPUs. You can imagine that you might want your GPU compute or your graph computation to occur at the edge on your smartphone. For example, if you're doing recommendation systems that are based on private browsing or shopping um, patterns. You don't want to send that off to the cloud. That's not very secure. But when you are doing something like um, like doing uh, speech recognition that requires big complicated language models, that's something that more occurs in the cloud. So I really think that support for both compu computations at the edge and in the cloud will be required. So that's why performance portability is interesting. So like I said, in this work, we developed a portable um, backend for a GPU graph application compiler. And when um, we implemented a bunch of optimizations, we did an empirical study collecting 240 hours of runtime data across six different GPUs. And we tried to come up with a definition of performance portability that makes sense in this domain. So I'm gonna quickly talk about the graph DSL and compiler. The original compiler was done by Sripathi Pai and Keshav Pingali. It was presented at UPSA 2016. Their original, their original work targets only NVIDIA GPUs. So this DSL, it's actually pretty simple. You basically just have types for nodes and edges and you have types for work lists because typically in graph applications, you put nodes on a work list and then you examine those nodes in parallel. Now the optimizing compiler has features that can do load balancing. It can do on-chip synchronization and it can do atomic read modify write coalescing. And I'm gonna briefly talk about those right now. So what do we mean by load balancing? So graphs have irregular parallelism and this leads to load imbalance. So if you have a work list with these nodes, 
typically what you want to do is traverse over their neighbors. Well, nodes have different numbers of neighbors. Some of them might have one neighbor like this middle node. Some of them might have lots of neighbors like this blue node. And if you assign threads to different nodes, they're gonna be imbalanced. So there are some pretty well-studied techniques how to do load balancing like this. And our compiler implements them as automatic optimizations. You can do them at, uh, the GPUs have a hierarchical execution model. So you can do this at the local level, the subgroup level, or the workgroup level, for those of you who know about GPU programming. This is basically three optimizations you can turn off and on. What do I mean by atomic read, modify, write coalescing? Well, graph applications typically need to do a read, modify, write operation to update values in nodes um, or to update the work list for the next iterations. What happens is if you do a read, modify, write, they have to be serialized if they conflict on different threads. So if you have three threads, each doing a read, modify, write, they have to be serialized. You can, you can see it takes three steps. Now, a compiler can be smart and they can say, these threads, they can do some local communication and then they can combine their update into one read, modify, write. And that's an optimization that our compiler has. Another option is on-chip synchronization. So lots of graph applications are iterative. That is, you do one round of computation and then you come back and then you do another round of computation. These are called epics. And on a GPU, what that means is returning to the CPU and then launching another GPU program, returning to the CPU, launching another GPU program. There are ways, although they're not officially supported, to move the synchronization all the way onto the GPU and close these gaps. So our compiler allows you to do that. Okay, so our empirical study. We have our five optimizations we talked about here. Load balancing, we have three variants of it. We have on-chip synchronization and read, modify, write, coalescing. Applications, we did seven applications. So for those of you who can remember back to your algorithms course, you have a couple fundamental graph applications. You have breadth first search, single source shortest path, page rank, connected components, maximal independent set, minimum spanning tree, and triangle counting. Now graphs can have a variety of different inputs. So we tried RMAT, which is basically representative of, of social networks, road networks, and sort of a uniform random graph. And the different GPUs we tried were two NVIDIA GPUs, an AMD GPU, two Intel GPUs, and an ARM GPU. And as far as we know, this is the widest empirical study across GPUs that we are aware of. I have yet to see anybody do um, four vendors and six GPUs. Okay. So performance portability. The question that we want to ask is which of these optimizations should we apply to provide the best performance across all of these applications on all of these inputs and all of these GPUs? Well, if we go back and look at classic definitions of performance portability, um, probably the simplest one can be um, summarized as do no harm. Only apply an optimization if it doesn't provide any slowdowns across the entire domain and provides at least one speed up. That seems to be pretty non-controversial. What we can do is we can query our data because we basically ran all combinations of optimizations across our entire data set. And what we actually find is that there's no optimization that fits this strategy. Um, basically any optimization that you flip on that I talked about, there's at least one GPU input application that will actually slow down because of it. So, you know, we might try to generalize this and we might say, maybe we want to do the least harm. So we, maybe we can select op optimizations that cause the fewest number of slowdowns. So if we do that, it ends up that it's just local load balancing that gets enabled. And if we actually look oh, across our entire data set, it only has a 1.01x geo mean speed up and a 2x max speed up. Now remember that if you sort of specialize um, exactly for the chip input and application, you can get a speed ups of up to 16x and a geo mean of 1.5x. So this is pretty underwhelming actually. Um, so again, you might try a different um, strategy where you, where you pick the optimizations that yield the highest geo mean and that, that would give you a 1.18x geo mean and it would enable these two optimizations which is the on-chip synchronization and the read modifier coalescing. But if you actually then go and look at the chips and if you break the slowdowns and speed ups across the chips, what you'll find is this optimization combination drastically has more slowdowns on the NVIDIA chips than any of the other chips. Um, that is, if you go for the highest geo mean, you're going to end up um, being biased against NVIDIA GPUs, and that's not something you want your compiler to do. Um, and the reason for that is that 
actually the NVIDIA GPUs are less sensitive to our optimization. So they um, basically provide the, the lowest speed ups when you do these things. And that's why if you go for the highest geomean, it ends up being biased against the NVIDIA GPUs. Okay, so our approach though, to actually get some meaningful optimizations that aren't biased and give us non-trivial results is we use a rank-based statistical procedure. What we do is we take one of the optimizations, let's say local load balancing, and then we um, just select one of the applications, one of the inputs, and one of the GPUs, let's say the NVIDIA Quattro. Um, now what you do is you, um, you measure the runtime with optimization off, and you measure the runtime with optimization on. Now you do that for a different chip. Let's say the ARM, you measure optimization on, you measure the optimization off. Um, you throw away the confidence intervals if they don't overlap, which means you have a meaningful result. And then what you do is you normalize the runtimes. You basically pairwise normalize them so that they're normalized to the optimization off. And then basically you're left with a bunch of dots that are either above or below the line, depending on whether the optimization caused a speed up or a slowdown. Now, if you do this across all the different chips, you end up with a bunch of different dots. And now what you do is you can apply a non-parametric, which basically means it doesn't consider ranks or it doesn't consider magnitudes of speed ups or slowdowns. But you just want to ask if that optimization is more likely to cause a slowdown or more likely to cause a speed up. And if you do that, then that a statistical test can basically tell you that this, is, this optimization is more likely to cause a speed, speed up or slowdown. And you can select optimizations based on that. So that gives us this optimization strategy, local load balancing, subgroup load balancing, and on-chip synchronization. Now, if we compare this to you know, when we tried to do the fewest slowdowns, we can see that we've turned that 2x max speed up into a 6x max speed up, and that 1.01x geomean into a 1.15x geomean. So this one is already a lot, it, it, overcomes, the short, it overcomes the shortcomings of this fewest slowdowns um, uh, strategy. Now, if we compare it to the highest geomean, remember the highest geomean was being biased against the NVIDIA chips. Well, because our technique is rank-based, it doesn't consider the magnitude, our new rank-based procedure is no longer biased against the NVIDIA chips, and it actually um, doesn't seem to be biased for or against any of the other chips. Um, just a final mention here is that when we do this work, it also has, we're also looking to have impact on GPU programming languages. Like I mentioned, this on-chip synchronization is not officially supported by GPU programming models. It's um, something that kind of GPU programmers have found seems to work on GPUs that are deployed. So um, from this work, we've been interacting with the Kronos group who provide languages like Vulkan and OpenCL. And we're working on them so that we can get official support for these, um, for these optimizations like on-chip synchronization because this optimization is in fact one that is enabled by our rank-based port performance portable um, optimization strategy. So it is important to have, even though it's not officially supported. So just to kind of summarize this part of the work, uh, it's a GPU compilers, um, GPU and graph applications, they're important. You know, I, I do think if we are going to eventually take advantage of the sparsity of problems, we need to be able to execute them on GPUs. Performance portability is really hard in this domain, um, but our rank-based statistical procedure uh, offers new ways of thinking about performance portability. So that kind of finishes up this one. Does anybody have any questions? I am curious of your perception of the place of products like graph core processors in the context of graph traversal compared to um, optimize GPU performance the way you're performing it, or specifically GPU performance on high-end iron like NVIDIA compared to performance of graph core and their approach to the same? So I, I would like to answer your question with, with one of my questions. If you know where I can easily get access to a graph core processor, because we've looked into it. And what's, what's nice about these GPUs is they're sort of everywhere. So we like, cobbling together our experimental infrastructure for this um, wasn't that much work, but we've, we've tried to find graph core chips to experiment on. And we, we haven't been able to find a, a system easily accessible. So we haven't done a lot of experiments there. I would love to though, if, if you have ideas on where to find them at a, at a price point that an academic can afford. 
what is the commercial interest in you're talking to people like Kronos about things like Vulcan? So what is the commercial interest in organizations like either Kronos or even places like NVIDIA to consider some of your optimizations in the context of stuff like CUDA or things like OpenCL? Yeah, so um, I mean, CUDA has a little bit of a history of this. Um, the academic research, it was a, a researcher by the name of Dwayne Merrill at University of Virginia came up, came up with some really interesting ways to optimize breadth first search on the GPU. But he went completely like off spec. He did all sorts of crazy things that the programming model didn't allow, but the chip seemed to implement. And slowly, that, I think that paper was published in 2012. Over the next eight years, NVIDIA has been, I mean, first off, they hired him and they've been working on incorporating, like actually putting some of these ideas into the specification. And now um, you have Gunrock, which is, it's still a university project at UC Davis but it's very much blessed by NVIDIA and they're doing really high-end graph computations. So the companies are open to this. Um, Kronos, again, they, they have invited me to, as part, to be part of their, um, one of their technical working groups to talk about this sort of stuff. So I do think they're open to this, especially if you can show real performance improvements on interesting domains. And I do think graph applications are that domain, even if they don't have an immediate commercial application. But yes, there is a very interesting history of how this stuff actually percolates into official GPU programming models. And NVIDIA, uh, OpenCL has kind of always played catch up to CUDA and I think they are continuing to do that. Okay. Uh, so the, um, the models that have been using natural language processing with GPU uh, are, are enormous. Uh, they've gotten major improvements, but the size of the models has gone from um, uh, 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 from uh, GP, uh, I'm sorry, GP2, GP3, talking about more than 100 billion parameters uh, and, and some of the earlier systems, BERT and ELMO. And then they're talking about now reducing the parameters with distilled BERT and, and Roberta and other types of things. So I'm wondering about some sort of interaction between the work that's done on the language and the machine learning basis, trying to reduce the number of parameters and sort of interacting with the hardware and maybe giving some sort of advice of uh, in, in this notion of the co-existence. Co, uh, you, you mentioned something about that earlier. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, I th you can correct me if I wrong, I'm wrong, but it, it sounds like you're uh, talking about um, kind of pruning dense neural networks and yes. and disparse. Yes, yes. and I, I think that is such a cool research area and, and they've made some really excellent progress on that in the last, um, I don't even just a year. Um, NVIDIA now has this framework. I would suggest, I would highly suggest checking out their paper called Condensa. And they try to automatically um, sparsify some of the neural networks. Um, what's, what's kind of funny is they show how much like the theoretical sparsity factor is. And then they basically multiply that by 32 because 32 is their vector lane width and say, we can, we can do it efficiently if you are a factor of our vector width because if you aren't a factor of their vector width, then their, your performance on an NVIDIA GPU is gonna suffer. But they have the pretty cool techniques for doing that. And um, that kind of leads to the next section of the talk. Um, but no, I think Bob, to answer your question, Bob, it's, it's really interesting research. And we are at a place where people are starting to learn how to prune these dense neural networks, but we don't know how to execute them efficiently yet. Um, just just quick question though, how much time do I, do I have? I, I was sort of planning on an hour talk. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Stop me if if anybody, if if uh, if I need to stop. So, um, so and and this and thanks for your question, Bob, because this just leads right into what I want to talk about. Um, you know, as part of my research, I believe that graphs need to be able to be efficiently computed on our current big data systems, which are basically GPUs right now. That was what the previous work was about, but. I also think we need to be developing next gen architectures that can efficiently compute graph applications. And this is so important in, in the context of people making sparse neural networks. We're learning how to just drop massive amounts of the parameters, but that creates a very random um, data structure that, that has sparse computations. And we need to be able to have architectures that can handle that. Um, so this is the work that I did while I was at Princeton with Margaret Martinosi. 
The, the scientific title I'm going to say is Decoupled Access Execute Architectures for Graph Applications. Um, I worked with a bunch of the students and researchers in Margaret's lab. Uh, Anida Manocha is the main PhD student, and as we all know, they do a lot of the work. So I am very thankful for the chance to get to work with her. And in fact, she did a bunch of these slides. Um, our technical publication for this is under submission, but we did do a technical presentation at FOSDEM. We did that right before the pandemic, I think it was in February, but you can watch that video here and that, that's Aninda presenting this work. Um, but this goes to um, what Bob mentioned in my introduction is I worked on the Decades Project. What is this project? Um, it's a massive DARPA funded uh, project called SDH, Software Defined Hardware. The goal of this project is to have coarse grained reconfigurable hardware to accelerate um, kind of the emerging data intensive software applications. Um, they're interested in machine learning and data science, and they're interested in graph analytics and sparse linear algebra. Um, not too surprising that these are the interesting applications these days. And so Decades is sort of the Princeton and Columbia collaboration that got uh, this big grant. Um, and the architecture, um, I think this was Margaret, David, and Luca who kind of came up with this drawing is a big heterogeneous tiled architecture where you have cores, you have accelerators, and then they have something at that point, what they called intelligent storage. And this is kind of like a programmable cache or different ways how to efficiently move data around the chip that is different than how you might uh, see in a Van Neumann architecture. Um, one thing that we've been committed to during this whole project is that our tools are all open source, compilers, simulators, everything. You can just go to this link and find them. Um, okay, so the Decades Project is this big chip. And what we've done is, We've kind of used this chip as a research playground where we can propose all sorts of interesting ideas on how to accelerate graph applications. So that's what I'm going to present next. So, you know, with the GPUs, we basically had to try to massage the applications through the compilers into a way that GPUs can efficiently compute them. But now that we have actual access to architecture design decisions, we can attack the problem more head on. And so what is the actual difficulty in graph applications? Well, if you do a lot of profiling, you'll find that the real bottleneck here is that the access patterns are irregular. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go through a quick example. Um, right here, you have a graph, you have how it might look as an adjacency matrix, and we have um, some code for computing the breadth first search. So what you're gonna do is you're going to start off by storing the root node in your frontier, we're gonna say we're gonna start off at zero. So that goes in our frontier. And in a breadth first search, you're always zero steps away from yourself. That takes care of this in the node. Then what you have to do is you look at the different neighbors. So one and three are neighbors to zero. And what you then do is you have to go into the node values and you have to update the values for node one and three. These are not necessarily consecutive. And in giant graphs like Instagram that have 1 billion nodes, these could be all over the place. Okay, so after you update the neighbor, this is where the indirect memory access is. You check to see if you need to update or if you need to add those neighbors to the frontier to um, compute on the next iteration. So we do need to add those neighbors. So one and three are added to the frontier and then we start the process over. This is where we get parallelism. We have nodes one and three, we can do those in parallel. And so uh, let's see. We can look at their neighbors, which are four and two. And you can again see when we go to update them, those memory locations are not necessarily next to each other. And because they're not next to each other, we have uh, irregular memory accesses. We could keep doing this and we'd eventually uh, terminate when we get nodes two and four inside the frontier because uh, there's no more nodes left to update. That's how that reasoning goes. So what is the problem? These irregular memory accesses, they have cache misses. And if you think about how long it takes to access different regions of memory on a computer chip, things get pretty bad when you start missing in the caches. L1 cache is best case. That's about a four cycle latency on a lot of chips. Last level cache is about 20 cycles. Again, maybe not so bad, but main memory is 200 cycles. If you miss in all your caches, you have to go to main memory. And what we did is we benchmarked a bunch of different applications. Again, we can see breadth for search, single source shortest path, page rank, um, graph projections, and a sparse neural network is this EWSD. And if you look at the total percentage of runtime, 
what we have lovingly called the llamas, which are the long latency memory accesses, take you know, over 70% of the execution time of these entire applications. And that's because of this latency. The way to sort of finish telling the story is if you look at how many miss rates these llamas have, is it's about 50% miss rate. So, excuse me, you can think every single time you update your neighbor, about half the time you're missing in your last level cache, which is causing 200 cycle latency. That's why these applications are so hard to accelerate on modern architectures. Um, but what I find encouraging is when you think about all these applications, PageRank, SSSP, BFS, there's really only one memory access. And when I say that, I mean that statically in your code that is the problem. It's this llama, it's the updating the neighbor. So it actually gives you a very finely tuned target when you want to make an architect architecture for optimizing these sorts of problems. So our approach, again, we've, we've lovingly called it fast llamas, which is full stack approach and specialization techniques for hiding long latency memory accesses. What we have is a data supply approach. Um, traditionally, you know, you, you'd have two cores and in our context, we're using in order risk five cores because we're actually developing a new architecture. You know, these cores would both do the same thing and they would both access memory and they'd both um, basically hit this, hit the long latency memory access, long, oh, sorry, they'd both hit the long latency memory accesses and um, basically have to pay the full cost. What we have is we have a more of a producer consumer instantiation where one of the cores acts like the, the producer and then it sends values to the consumer and then the consumer stores the result back to memory. And it creates this sort of cyclic computation pattern, whereas this one's just back and forth. Now, we were actually uh, pretty surprised at how well this works for graph applications. We were able to, to achieve an 8.66x speed up on the decades architecture using just two tiny in-order processors. So I want to give you more details on how that actually works. Let's talk about decoupling. Uh, decoupling, or it's also called DAE, was a technique I think first published in 1982. It takes a sequential program and it divides the program into producer and consumer pairs. So, you know, if you think about traditional parallelism, usually you parallelize both cores. Some will do some producing, and by producing, we, need, we mean memory loads, and they'll do a bunch of compute. And consuming basically means compute. And traditional parallelism just does each core kind of does the same thing. But in decoupling, you specialize your cores. You make one of the cores always do the producing and one of them always do the consuming. And this is where you get the heterogeneity. And what you want is you want the producer to run ahead of the consumer so it can start prefetching those long latency memory accesses. And once it gets those long latency memory accesses, it can queue them up into a, a shared queue between the producer and consumer so that the consumer can read them without the latency. So let's see, I think An Aninda has this nice uh, animation here where you have the producer and consumer. The producer will ask for a data request. It'll go to the memory hierarchy. It'll come back and the data then goes to this queue, which is then eventually read by the consumer. And that's how this looks. It looks like a round, it looks like more complicated than if the consumer was to directly access the memory. But the idea here is that you get run ahead. And then we're gonna visualize that here in a second. Um, let's see. Okay, so where this can actually pay off though is when you have long latency memory accesses on the producer side. Now, if the producer, um, if these long latency memory accesses depend on each other, the producer has to wait and for these long latency memory accesses to complete. You can't really run ahead of dependencies, especially not on in order cores like the type we're looking at. But if you're smart enough in the compiler, what you can do is you can intelligently slice your program to get rid of these dependencies that happen when you do the neighbor updates in graph applications. Now, what that means is that you can take your memory accesses and you can overlap them. The producer no longer needs to wait on the result. So it can just basically enqueue these up and run ahead. And so what happens is you do have a little bit of a warm up period where the producer is basically initializing getting those first couple of loads. But eventually what's gonna happen is these long latency loads are going to overlap and just be ready for the consumer to eat. 
um, in sequence. So a couple of extra details. Um, and then the slides are very good, but I will leave those up for a sec. Basically what I explained in words. Um, okay, so let's talk about fast llamas. If you look at the graph application, remember we talked about basically you have the process node operation, you have your update neighbor, and you have your add to frontier. A lot of graph applications can basically de be distilled down to these three operations. Now the llama is when you update your neighbor. It's when you go into your memory to get your neighbor, which, could, which is a random memory access. And you can see that the llama takes up the most amount of time. Now, you know, okay, let's see. What we do is in the compiler, we do a slicing so that we basically remove the dependency um, from the producer, which does, which issues the llama and does a process node. And we place those all on the consumer. So that allows us to get a uh, code slicing where the producer basically just in a tight loop initializes all of these memory requests. And then these memory requests get fed to the consumer that can then do these um, without waiting for the long latency. Um, let's see. And yeah, like we talked about, there is a warm up period for the first couple of llamas to come back. How does this actually look in the architecture? Well, like we said, we're based on in-order cores. So we have our little in-order cores up here. And I know this looks like we're adding a lot, but these are actually just small buffers that have negligible energy and area overhead. These are basically just FIFO queues. Now, what we have to have is we have to have this asynchronous access buffer. This is the only really complicated hardware component where the in-order core says that sends the asynchronous access buffer an address. And this buffer is in charge of going to the memory hierarchy and loading that result and then sending it over to the consumer. That's a pretty simple hardware component though. It's basically a simple load unit and it actually doesn't end up uh, causing that much complexity to this design. So it, given that we have in-order cores, some FIFOs and a little ALU in case you need to up, um, do, uh, for example, sometimes you need to do uh, min operator on some of the node data. Like if you're doing a shortest path operation, you need to make sure that you are um, actually uh, returning the shortest path. And that's what this ALU is for. Um, it's a small amount of hardware support. So it actually ends up doesn't not being too bad. Let's see there. Aninda did highlight some of these paths. Um, if we look at some results, we basically took some um, vertex programmable graph processing algorithms like breadth for search, page rank, single source, shortest path. We also have uh, graph projections. That's a popular one for recommendation systems and this element wise sparse dense um, operation. That kind of is one of uh, a kernel that Bob might've been referring to where you take a dense matrix and you drop a bunch of weights and then you now have random accesses into that formally dense matrix. And what you end up seeing is here we're um, doing one in order risk five core, and then we're comparing it to kind of two classical parallel in order cores. That's the blue one. That's if you're doing homogeneous parallelism. Then we have one fast llama pair. So remember that takes two cores. It takes a producer consumer. That's why it's fair to compare it against two other in order cores. And then um, just to see how well we're doing, we are comparing it to one in order core with a perfect cache because um, the, uh, the, the overall bottleneck in these applications is that long latency memory access. So basically the perfect cache um, benchmark here, it, it's an upper bound. It's basically saying, um, if you didn't have to wait for any of your memory requests, what would it be? So what you can see, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, are these results in simulation or implemented? Uh, simulation at this point. We are getting very close to an implementation though. Um, I should note that the, the decades project is, um, on a roadmap has an actual tape out. In, in a better world, we would have had a tape out by now, but the pandemic has really thrown everything behind. Um, we're still planning on one, but uh, things are a little bit, the timeline is a bit uh, screwed up now, but we do have FPGA implementations at this point. And the FPGA results are corresponding to our, our simulation results. We haven't seen anything to really cast these results into, into question. Um, so what you can see is with the homogeneous parallelism, you roughly get close to 2x speed up. You might expect that um, just because you end up getting 2x memory parallelism when you're doing this. So 
that's that's not too surprising. But when you actually do the specialization, the producer consumer, you get you use two cores and you get a much higher than two x speed up, up to three, five, four, five. So you get some pretty impressive speed up results, and that's because we have this ability to asynchronously issue long latency memory loads and basically queue them up. Um, and then the consumer basically is able to compute them without waiting for them. And it actually ends up become, getting really close to perfect cache in some cases. So that basically means that the producer was able to hide most of the memory latency. So we're pretty encouraged by these results. Um, let's see, and it has some of these um, we get in, in our best case, we get up to 96% of perfect cash. Um, best case is 5.3x speed up. Um, okay. And I know I did advertise an 8.66x speed up. I should note that these results are the geo mean across a bunch of different inputs. And if you actually go and look at them input by input, we get uh, higher speed ups. And I think the biggest speed ups we get are on the cron data set, which are, uh, it's basically synthetic graphs that simulate social. Uh, media networks. So that it's actually pretty good because those are traditionally the hardest ones to speed up. Um, okay, so just the overview of the, uh, of the decades project is, uh, well, this is Fast Llamas, which is a hardware software co-design that we can implement on top of decades. We have uh, producer consumer slicing that actually allows us to hide the long latency memory accesses in these graph computations. The decades team, we're planning on taping out a chip, so it is a lot of people. Um, Margaret Martinosi, David Wensloff, and Luca Carloni are the PIs. And then there's a bunch of PhD students who I really appreciate because they do a lot of the, the hard work and a bunch of postdocs too. Um, all of our tools are open source, so you can check it out. And you know that, so that's uh, how we're trying to design the next gen architectures to efficiently do graph applications. And just to kind of summarize this whole talk, you know, I want you to, when you go away, I want you to ask where the next thousand X of performance is going to come from. And I want you to take away that I really don't think we're going to get another thousand X performance improvements for matrix multiplication, especially not for free. Frequency scaling is basically over because of Denard scaling is over. Parallelism, well, Moore's law is ending. Nobody's really saying much past three nanometers. And, you know, we could get more specialized matrix multiplication chips, but we've kind of already done that. So I want you to think that I, I want you to entertain the thought of embracing sparsity. We need language support. We need optimizing compilers for existing computers like GPUs. It is hard, but um, we do have some interesting techniques that we're developing. And then looking a little bit more forward, we need new architectures that address the, the bottlenecks head on, which is basically the memory latency from the irregular memory accesses. And like I said, I work at the programming language and architecture part of this. I would love to work with some actual data scientists who can give us more concrete applications. But again, it's one of these uh, hammer and nails. And right now we're working on building an interesting hammer, I think. So uh, that concludes my talk. Thanks to all my collaborators. Um, like I said, I am accepting grad students at uh, UC Santa Cruz. If you know anybody, send them my way. So with that I'll conclude and I can take any questions. Thank you, Tyler. What do you know about this new um, or somewhat new uh, wafer scale engine from, who's it from here? Um, Cerebrus. Cerebrus, yeah. I will have to check that out because I don't know that I know anything about it. Can you, can you tell me what, what they're saying it's going to well, be? Well, this is something I came across today, but world's largest computer chip getting a major performance boost. Uh, 2.6 trillion transistors across 8,000 or 850,000 computer cores. It's about the size of an iPad. Wow. It's a yes. wafer scale integration essentially engine. It's about 10,000 times the performance of relatively large clusters because there's so much locality on the device. The device has this incredibly explicit and high bandwidth it's essentially everything's on chip except it's on die mm -hmm. and the die is literally oh it, it's a square on the order of uh, i don't know 25 centimeters on the side yeah, well, it's, yeah it's bigger than a keyboard <laughs> interesting so i mean if it's got really high bandwidth and if 
is it going to be good at matrix multiplication i guess is is it yes, sort it of it's, keep... it's a matrix engine it's a convolution engine it's a convolution engine yeah. okay i mean I'll, I'll have to check that out and you know i i don't mean to diminish any of the um really good work that people are doing in this area and in fact there was that new arm cluster that is incredibly energy efficient and i think it made it onto the top 500 list basically a cluster of arm chips and that was really cool so yes people are doing interesting and important things here i i'm kind of just hypothesizing that i don't know how much how much more this will scale and especially where sparsity is kind of just sitting there it seems like an easy maybe not an easy target but an available target what's well, what I, tpus one of the things that tpus excel at is sparse matrices they're essentially they look like systolic arrays on the inside right um, and i'm very curious that that leads to sort of a question about your architecture but i'll i'll do the preface first it seems to me that it's very interesting that this tile project is risk five core based so that suggests that the risk five core is gaining real traction in terms of academic or engineering circles by virtue of the fact that it's becoming the Linux of processor cores. Yes, I think that's exactly what they would like to see on their PR statements, the Linux of cores, yes. Okay, um, question, question one and question two is, when I look at this sort of notion of producer consumer models in terms of minimizing latency by, in a sense, de facto pipelining, if you really turn the idea on its side, it sort of starts to again look like a data flow architecture of sorts, no? Um, but so, what? What architect? Are you thinking of a specific architecture or a, a data flow architecture? Okay. In the sense that the consumer essentially is satisfied when inputs are present, and you're trying to minimize the latency by having the input stage handled by the producers. Yes, and so I the mean, producers are sitting on the input side in the sense virtually. So it is. I, I mean, it's perhaps a stretch, but if you really think about it, by virtue of the fact that the um, input is pipeline from the producer to consumer on every node, it is in effect starts to and you know, a lot of CUDA programming, a lot of aspirations in high performance environments start to aspire towards a data flow like architecture and data flow like semantics. I'm very curious what the internal semantics are of your DSL. Does it start to look like data flow at all? Um, so there's a couple parts to that. So I, I want to back up just a little bit and say, yeah, this is this is like a pipelining architecture. You are right, and a data flow architecture. And basically, yes, you are just sort of getting a lot of memory level parallelism and 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 queuing up a bunch of data to be consumed by another processor. Um, what I would say is different about the decades architecture is it. The SDH program was wanted to do coarse grained reconfigurable. So we kind of needed to design an architecture that aimed to be good at a lot of different computations. And the idea of having these like FIFO queues for efficient communication between the processors is just a small hardware addition where you can say, you know, you can have either traditional parallelism on a, array, a many core of in order cores, or you can change it. You can basically compile it in a certain way and get this data flow. Um, mode that the chip can can go into that's actually really good at graph computations. So it's a, supposed to be a reconfigurable architecture, coarser grain than an FPGA, but still kind of allow you to shift those modes that you can compute in. So I'd say that's, I know there's like not a lot of novel insight there, but in realizing that in an actual um, project that we do aim to tape out, I do think is kind of an ambitious undertaking. Um, so in terms of like, you, you were also asking if the DSL will eventually look like a data flow problem. Um, the DSL right now is pretty basic. It has work lists, it has nodes and edges. And the way we compile it to a GPU doesn't really look like a data flow. It, it's basically just trying to get as much parallelism as possible in the GPU. And that's why we do things like load balancing. We do read, modify, write, coalescing and we do um, kind of on-chip synchronization. So the, those things aren't really data flow um, optimizations. They're more about just increasing the amount of parallelism like that is happening on the GPU. That's I'm not sure if I could see how to implement data flow optimizations for graphs though. Like, do you mean 
bringing in data from the graph and storing it in the software managed cache. Well, in a sense, I mean, if you think about it by virtue of the fact that you've got this producer consumer model, all the producers are effectively a kind of cache. Yes. Right? Isn't that de facto the case? So you're essentially using processor silicon to uh, increase cash by virtue of the fact that the consumer needs that kind of bandwidth, which is fine. It's kind of a neat problem. Yeah. I suppose what I'm asking is that it always seems to be that um, large scale architectures um, always dabble in the domain of data flow graphs, whether at the level of the compiler down in the guts, architecturally at the level of the processor, or actually in a domain specific language. Now, data flow languages have a really hard time scaling if you've ever worked in one, but architecturally, if you can sort of think inductively that if I have a cell and I had many, many cells and I could populate them essentially like a tree that I could talk about in the abstract and then have a consumer model that essentially operates when operands are available, that starts to very much sound like a data flow computer. GPUs really are far more like heavily, heavily threaded boxes. They're very, very highly threaded boxes. So optimization of memory and thread utilization and minimizing external memory rights, the name of the game. That's really where it sits like in your bailiwick, it seems. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I understand exactly like uh, data flow language. I don't know if I've ever looked, worked with one exactly, but I do think I'm getting the essence of the question in that, you know, for the, for the last part that we talked about for this fast llamas thing, we do have a compiler that goes through and analyzes dependencies and slices the program in a in a way such that the dependencies kind of go away, at least on the producer side, and it allows you to basically become a flow problem, an unimpeded flow problem from the producer to consumer. Okay. So right. thank you, yeah. Tyler. I got, I've got one. Um, when I I read a paper uh, from UMass about the enormous amount of energy that was being used in the machine learning models. Um, and I think in contrast to this, the brain does what it does with only 20 watts. I'm wondering about maybe some sort of uh, uh, things of insight from neuroscience that would help uh, in, in how does the brain do think these things so efficiently? I think I know exactly the article you're talking about. I, it came up when I was, um, when I was actually looking for mo more motivation, you know, and it didn't say something like, uh, training some of the biggest models these days take as much energy as like five lifetime cars or something. Something like that. Andrew McCallum was the one, was one of the authors. Yeah, that's a really interesting article. And, and then, yeah, at the end, they, they, they t bring up this idea that the brain has more, basically more raw computational power on much less energy. Um, so I'm actually not sure, maybe somebody else can comment what, I mean, you might have to go into the realm of biological computing for that. And I know there are some researchers like at University of Washington working on that. I don't know too much about it though. So I, I don't know. I think, if I'd I think it'd be a cool way to get insight into compilers through the brain architecture. Yeah, I, I mean, I would be interested in, in learning more about it, but it, it's, it's true. And I think the essence of what they're getting at there though is that these deep neural networks are not efficient. And I think we've known that for a while and people are writing yeah. more and more convincing articles to say, hey, these things are not efficient. There's better ways. And some people are thinking kind of far out ideas like the brain, <laughs> I would say, and other people uh, like I would say me are thinking that actually the underlying problem looks like a graph problem. Maybe we can start there, but no, I, I do think it's, it's interesting. And I think we're getting at similar points, even if they're a bit more ambitious than <laughs> my presentation. <laughs> I have a question about the uh, customer ad matching and the use of matrix math for that. Um, are these algorithms able to take good advantage of tensor cores on GPUs? I think I think they are. I think that's one of the reasons why GPUs have tensor cores now is, is basically as a fast path for these sorts of matrix multiplications that do occur in um, convolutions and fully connected layers, and especially for these recommendation systems. Yes, I, I do think- 
Yeah. Okay. And one, one quick follow up. One of the GPs that came out last year from NVIDIA, the Turing 102, has 32 regular ALU, ALUs per, it's either four or eight tensor cores. Do you know if there are, um, so anyway, that seems like a constraint for some products that are designed to support primarily as a, to keep to earn their bread and butter the PC game market. Yeah, I, so when I was a PhD student, I did two internships at NVIDIA, but that's actually been a while ago now, 2014, 2015. And it, it, I don't have as much insider information as I did back then, but the, the trend is, um, the trend is interesting because they seem like they ha are having a bit of an identity crisis, whether they want to make a tensor processing unit or a GPU. And, they're, and right now, like the Turing, it seems like they're sort of straddling that. They have these tensor processing units along with the graphics pipeline and stuff like that. And I'm not sure if I, if I know how they're gonna resolve it, but yeah, right now it seems like they're trying to do a couple of things really well at the same time. And I do wonder if eventually we'll see that split into different product lines or if they will continue trying to, trying to do it all reasonably well. Like that would be nice one day if they do. I mean, and, and given that, um, you know, I'll basically what I said two slides ago, let's see, that, you know, Denard scaling is over, Moore's law is ending. We, the way we're gonna get performance improvements is through specialization it might be the way they have to go if they want to continue their, their performance increases. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I really think that this entire game is so early in the process. I remember I had uh, Jan LeCun present at my kid's high school in about 2010 mm. before he was at, at, uh, at Facebook. And I really think that the I think the game is very, very early. I really think that GPUs are a stopgap measure compared mm -hmm. to what's coming next. And I also, industry seems to very much agree with your assertion that this is what's considered. I mean, if you've been in the parallel computing business for 30 or 40 years, you know, back to connection machines and before that, um, you've seen a lot of architectures of very many different kinds come and go. And I think that age is coming back. I think. Um, different architectures, specialized architectures are really the name of the game. The obvious support of that is something like this Apple M1 processor. It has two or three dedicated pieces of silicon for specific function in the device uh, integrated across uniform memory access. Now, it's a consumer device, but its functionality is extraordinary. Its performance is extraordinary. And that's this is early. This is their, their first draft of a consumer processor. So this is all this is all very early in the game. This is a little bit like microprocessors in the 70s. It's really rather early in the game. Yeah, I I mean, and just to echo that, um, you know, Hennessy and Patterson in their Turing Award lecture, they they called this the new golden age of computer architecture, basically saying we're we're entering into a post ISA world. Yeah, you know, and that's what Margaret it sounds like is going to talk about in a couple of weeks at this meeting. So I mean, I agree completely. We're, we're getting to the point where academics now have enough money to tape out a chip. <laughs> I think for the DARPA SDH project, there's Princeton, University of Washington, MIT, and maybe one other, but that, that's four universities that are taping out chips. And, and they're all kind of interesting heterogeneous architectures. So absolutely, I, I think it's a very exciting time to be working on programming languages and architecture. You familiar with MOSIS? I don't think I'm familiar with that, no. M-O-S-I-S, -S, really? M-O-S-I-S, -S. no, I, I don't think so. Your students have been able to tape out chips for 20 years. Yeah, <laughs> well, I guess what, well, so they did it at Berkeley, right? The, like Hennessy and Patterson's Turing Award lecture, they, they told stories about taping out chips as part of an undergraduate class. I guess it's, uh, what I mean is these seem like they're actually kind of competitive chips that seem seem like somewhat serious projects. I don't know what what Moses is though. Moses was low Moses was student geometry for its day, but let you 
tape. If you had the tools, if you had access, you could sit in a production line, get a little bit of spare capacity and have a few pieces made for you for your lab. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> uh, it's kind of cool. Look it up, MOSIS. But yeah, yes, this is an extraordinary time and a lot of different approaches are being tried. And, um, and that's what's really interesting about it. But the really extraordinary thing is if you talk to engineers and software people at various levels is the, um, this has really been a problem for some time is that parallelism is one thing to build and another to um, disperse. Um, a lot of engineers I run to at a different level of granularity, their notion of parallelism is, well, I'll just fire up more, more virtual machines. So there is no notion of computational efficiency. Um, typically teams like that do not have deep knowledge and do not have an appreciation as it were for laws of scaling and how to dispatch tasks on machines as opposed to the most sort of egregious and low granularity approaches. But in my estimation, I mean, I've educated people in computer science for a while and it's extraordinary to me that at this stage of the game, very few people know how to program in parallel. Very, very few people. So it's uh, another part of the problem, actually. I read, I read an interesting statistic in NVIDIA marketing that you might all might find interesting, and you know, just briefly, um, this came out a year ago on their website um, when I had prepared a talk about the architecture of the Turing 102 for TCF. Uh, at that point in time, they had a catalog of 600 uh, programs that for what they have coined in the name high performance computing market, where a Turing 102 or other GPU is next, you use your next to a Pentium, as they often are, but not for graphics, but for industrial, scientific, medical, a wide ver a range of, they list about 10 different markets and claim that there are 600 shrink wrap things on, on the shelf now, and that the average performance improvement that industry sees by using an, a GPU next to the Pentium with these programs is 10x. And so they're trying to sell into uh, server uh, markets with uh, Pentiums and GPUs together for the 10x. And these high 600 plus, probably more today, high performance computing programs, they call them. Just thought you might find it interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you just, these days you want to accelerate anything you possibly can on a GPU, but it, it kind of goes back to what Hernando was saying. Um, you also have to know how to program them. <laughs> and a lot of people are a bit, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say scared, but maybe uncomfortable and maybe not as efficient at programming GPUs. So if, if they can distill 600 programs and maybe give people libraries to call into, that's, that's a bit better. But yeah, it's pe people are going to have to learn how to program these things. And if you do, it can um, give you some pretty big benefits, I think. OK, well, thank you very much, Tyler. Yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Can I ask a question? Oh, well, go ahead. I, I, well, I mean, I, I don't want to interrupt, but if, if we're getting toward the end, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm up for it. Oh, OK. So uh, it was it's my recollection, but I, I may be wrong, uh, that one of the Danny Hillis machines had some kind of specialized hardware uh, on it for the purpose of traversing graphs. And I was wondering if you uh, were aware of it or recall anything about it. And then to follow up on that, I'm interested in knowing whether uh, you see architectures in the future that will have some sort of either hybrid or other heterogeneous uh, units where one part mostly does traversal as fast as possible, and another part does uh, the arithmetic. Yes, um, I'll answer your second part first because I think that's an easier <laughs> question for me. Um, yes, I do think we will and start to see hybrid type machines. And part of the, the reason why is 
I don't think we're going to see a sudden shift from dense computations into sparse computations. I think what we're going to see is um, slowly people starting to, to do some of the computations sparsely and still offloading to these really cool and, and you know, really well-developed machines like GPUs that are good at dense. And so, yes, I do think you'd get stuff like that. And in fact, one of the applications that DARPA specifically asked us to look at was one where you would basically do random walks on a graph and use that as an embedding to a dense processor like a GPU. So I think that's the kind of the next step in this. So, and you know, I hope so, because that's what I'm kind of basing my research on. <laughs> so I do have a bit of a stake in this too. Um, to answer your first question, uh, I think I've seen a couple of architectures. I'm more familiar with the academic proposed architectures for graph traversals. Um, I haven't been able to experiment with any of them personally, like running experiments on them. I would like to. Um, you have to be careful though, because graph applications, the actual algorithms that we use have really undergo, undergone um, some evolutions in the last 10 years. And my favorite story is, um, and it, in fact, he's my colleague at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, his name is Scott Beamer. And what he did is he found out a new way how to do breadth for search, which basically allows you to prune a huge percentage of the edge traversals that you have to do. And he got on the Graph 500, which is basically the world record for the breadth for search. And he kicked off supercomputers with his iPad because he had a new algorithm that was able to do breadth for search faster. Uh, it turns out that his algorithm for doing breadth for search is extremely hard to parallelize because it has some pretty nasty control flow dependencies. Um, so when I think about architectures that have graph traversals built in, I have to wonder if they can handle the kind of complex control flow dependencies that the newer algorithms have. And that's one thing that we were careful for with fast llamas is to make sure that it could, that we had compilers support to handle sort of complicated dependencies. But I haven't seen graph architectures that have been able to handle these newer algorithms. If, if you want to look that up, it's called um, Direction Optimizing Breadth for Search. And I think it was published at SC in 2012. Uh, thank you.